Reading Queen, my fellow bookworms. Today we're going to be reading The Hidden Seek. Of course. <laughs> come out, come out wherever you are. Chapters 7 through 9. Now, if you are using, if you are going to sleep right now and you just need something to, you know, help you go to sleep. Just close your eyes, relax your muscles. I'll be with you in a second. Hello, I'm back and let's do this. Chapter 7. Holly jerked forward at their abrupt stop, and for a split second she thought she was going to go flying out of the ox cart, but an outstretched arm caught her and Hector both. It was Oliver, who had obviously anticipated what would happen. She got the sense that this was all the all a routine to him, that he had done this many times before. Oliver leapt off the cart. His scraggly, his scraggly mane of hair bouncing in the air. Then he reached and picked Hector up and set him on the ground. Holly jumped down by herself. We have arrived, he said. Holly took in, her, in their surroundings. They were in a forest of impossibly tall trees. So many trees. All, all fir or spruce or pine with their long, naked trunks and pointy, prickly leaves. The fog had cleared, but the forest was so thick that all, the, all was cast in shadow, even though it was still daylight. Beneath her shoes, the ground was damp and mossy. Some rustling in the brush revealed a squirrel. It scurried away. Where are we? Holly asked. How could a forest suddenly appear out of nowhere? Where was her neighborhood? How were they going to get back home? Oliver knelt, knelt to meet her and Hector at eye level. I'm going to tell you what I have told every child I bring to the hidden seek. His voice had turned so, so somber. His eyes were glazed like he was daydreaming. There is a way out, he said, but you won't make it. He blinked, immersion. Emerging from his trance, he locked eyes with Holly. No one ever has. Holly began to panic. That's not what you said. You said we could get back if we play. Oliver stood up and brushed off his knee. He was all business again. It starts with counting, he said, putting a hand on his ox cart and looked like he was getting ready to climb back on. Is he leaving us here? Listen for the count, he continued. You will not have much time to hide. He climbed aboard. Wait, Holly called after him. Where do we go? What are we supposed to do? From somewhere deep inside the forest, a bell rang. A single clang. Its tone was muted and flat, like it was covered in a shroud. A moment later, it rang again. This time, twice in a row. She is coming, Oliver said as the oxen began to move. He had a strange look on his face. It seemed like pity. It is coming, he nodded at them, whether you are ready or not. Then he, cl then he and his oxen rolled away, disappearing into the forest. The bell kept ringing three times, then four, then five. It starts with counting, Holly said. Holly thought, all at once, the pieces fit together. The counting, his last words to her, whether you're ready or, or obvious, or, or not. It was so obvious. Hector, she said, huh? Of all the stupid tricks to play on me, she said, why did it have to be hide and seek? The count was in, du in the double digits now, the continuous ringing sound like an alarm. Holly sp spun around, trying to decide what to do. They were surrounded by trees, long and foreboding. There was n nothing but shadow and the unknown in every direction. She didn't know which way to turn. The ringing stopped. 
The sudden quiet was unnerving. Now there was just the wind and the rustling of foliage and the faint chittering of hidden wildlife. Then, from somewhere behind them, a slow, mournful wail broke through the woods. It was barely more than a whimper at first, but it quickly grew louder, louder, stronger. The cry was ghostly and eerie, and worst of all, it was close. What was that? Hector asked. Run, Holly said. What? Holly grabbed Hector's hand. Run! She sprinted away, charging into the gloom of the forest, dragging Hector with her. The so she sidestepped and dodged trees as she ran, not daring to break her stride or slow down. All she saw in front of her were more trees, nothing that could conceal them from whatever had made that awful sound. She kept running, all the while looking for somewhere to hide, for any place that could keep them safe. Another cry from behind, this one not a for a forlorn moaning, but instead a, a, soul, a soul rattling howl, like something was calling out to her, but also shrieking in pain. Holly looked behind her. In the distance, she saw two, she saw two eyes, red and glowing. They were the eyes of an animal on the hunt, and they were staring right at her. Those eyes saw her. She could tell. They shone with the recognition of exactly who and what Holly was. She was their prey. Hector, she said, climb that tree. What? It was all she could think of. Whatever that red-eyed thing, thing was, she hoped it couldn't climb. She pulled Hector over to a bent and ancient bird tree. This would be easier to climb than the tall pine trees that dominated the forest. The lowest branch was still fairly high off the ground, though. Here, she said. I'll give you a bo boost. She bent over and joined her hands together. Hector hesitated, so she snapped at him. Now! He put his foot on her hands as she boosted him up. He stretched for the branch and grabbed it, pulling himself onto the tree. Come on. She reached a hand down ready to, to help pull her up. Holly stood on her tiptoes and stretched her arms. Their hands didn't touch. She tried jumping, but she couldn't get high enough. He was just barely out of reach. Try climbing the trunk, Hector said. She started towards the base of the tree, but a deep gr guttural growl stopped in her tracks. Stopped her in her tracks. It was too late. She turned to see the animal step slowly out of the shadows of the forest. It was a wolf. Its fur was completely black. There wasn't a single spot of gray or white, as if the beast had been coated in midnight. Its red eyes were like two burning embers. Run, Holly! Hector screamed at her. Run! Holly ran for her life. That was chapter seven. Getting intense, right, guys? That sounded cringe. Right, guys? Okay, well, anyways, moving on to chapter eight. Let's go. Holly tore through the woods as fast as she could, no longer trying to dodge trees. She banged her elbows and shoulders against their trunks, collecting cuts and bruises that she didn't even slow down to acknowledge. She could hear the wolf moving fast behind her, so Holly had to run faster, her chest heaving and tears coming to her eyes. The ground was getting uneven, and Holly stumbled. Tall grass and spindly branches slapped at her legs and waist, slowing her down. There was too much shrubbery. There were too many trees. She couldn't see ahead. Suddenly, there was nothing under her feet. She was fit, falling, skidding on her elbows, tumbling down into the dirt. She landed hard on her back. Ow, she said. She listened. There was no sound of pursuit, no moaning or howling. 
I have to make my way back to Hector, she thought, picking herself off the ground. That's when she noticed that that she noticed what was right in front of her. It was not what she expected. The forest had thinned out. There was a thin line of trees, and just beyond that, the woods gave way to a sprawling field. The clearing was wide, as big as a soccer field at least. Strange objects were scattered all over the clearing, but Holly couldn't quite make out what they were from a distance. Then she noticed something else. At the edge of the field, squatting with their backs against a tree, were two other kids. They were far away. They were far enough away that they hadn't noticed Holly emerge from the forest. She quietly inched her way toward them. One was a boy with frayed holes in his jeans and t-shirt. Jeans and t-shirt. His skin was a sandy brown, a touch lighter than Holly's and his dark brown hair was matted with sweat and grime. The other girl, fair-skinned, also in jeans with a purple shirt. Her hair was blonde at the roots, but sprouted out in a rainbow, in a rainbow of bright pink and blue. As she got near, she could hear them whispering back and forth, their voices straining to, say, to stay quiet. They were arguing. He's right there, the boy said. He glanced around the tree and out into the field. This is our chance. You heard the bell, the girl responded. Her voice was tight with fear. Don't be stupid. Holly hesitated, instinctively reluctant to insert herself where she might not be wanted. But the red-eyed wolf might still... Wolf might still be chasing her, and these kids might know something. She darted forward. Gra- for- she darted forward, grass and, and dead leaves crunching under her shoes. They turned at the sound of Holly approaching. Holly skidded to a stop and crouched down. They gawked at her. Holly, the boy, Holly, the boy said, his voice full of disbelief. Max. You know her? The girl asked. Huh? I replied. How does he know my name? She studied his face, his dark brown eyes, the mole on his right cheek, searching for any sign of familiar, familiar, familiarity. She had never seen this boy before in her life. Um, um, yes, I'm Holly. She didn't know what else to say. You don't, the boy, the boy began, then shook his head. Never mind. Of course you don't. What are you doing here? Keep your voices down, the girl hissed. We have to go now. Wait, Max pointed. Look. They looked. Holly gasped. Now that she was closer, she could finally make out what those strange things in the field actually were. They were statues scattered acro- across the clearing like tombstones and tombstones in a graveyard. They didn't look like normal statues, though. Each one showed a, showed a person in some sort of distress. Some were cowering on the ground, their heads between their knees. Some were looking at the sky, their arms covering their faces as if trying to shield their eyes. One looked like a girl who was running, her legs in, in mid-stride. The statue had toppled over onto the ground. All of the statues were short. Not just short, Holly realized. They're kids. They're all kids. And then she saw movement. Huddled next to one of the statues was a boy. He looked younger than Holly, maybe Hector's age. His skin was so pale it practically glowed. But the most striking thing about him was his hair. It was gray. The boy saw them. He waved. Holly couldn't be sure, but it looked like he was smiling. Then he ducked behind the statue, disappearing from view. Unbelievable, Max said through gritted teeth. Then he turned to Holly. His expression was pained, almost desperate. I'll be right back. Stay here. This is our best shot at getting home. Don't, the girl reached for him, but Max didn't seem to notice. He sprang up and bolted into the open field. 
Max, the girl called after him, but it was no use. He sprinted away, taking big, clumsy strides towards the statue where the gray-haired boy was hiding. He made it to the statue and tumbled down. He got on his hands and knees, crawling around, searching. He made a full circle around the statue. No one was there. Then the statue's eyes glowed red, sparking like a flare. Aru! From the, behind them came a howl. The girl in the purple shirt grabbed Holly's arm. She squeezed so hard it hurt. Get low, the girl whispered. Hide. Holly heard something burst out of the greenery above the ridge. She turned to see the wolf in midair leaping down in a streak of fur and fangs. It landed in stride and charged in their direction. Holly sat with her back against the tree, frozen in place. The girl next to her lay flat, her belly on the ground. The wolf raced toward them. Its white fangs flashed as it got closer and closer. There was no way where Holly could run to. No time to move or hide. She closed her eyes and thought of her mom, her dad. She thought of Hector, hoping he was safe. But the beast dashed right past her. Holly trembled, a spike of fear and relief coursing through her at once. Her heart was pounding. The girl next to her, though, looked anything but relieved. She was, she was staring into the field, her expression grim and helpless. Max, the girl whispered, her voice breaking. The way she said his name sounded sad and final, like she was saying goodbye. Holly peeked around the tree. Max was on his hands and knees by the statue, huddling beneath it, clinging to the shadows. And there was a wolf growling in front of him, taking slow steps closer and closer. It had him cornered. Max shook his head back and forth, pleading. No, no, no. Then the wolf did something strange. It rose up on its hind legs. It stretched, its entire body getting longer. Its dark fur rippled, rippled across its body, coming loose and billowing out like a cape caught in the wind. The fur became a dress, long and whispery, and still utterly black. From the dress's sleeves, naked arms appeared, as, pa as pale as moonlight. Where there had once been paws, there were now bare feet. Finally at the top, the wolf's head disappeared in a silky wave of long black hair. The hair framed a fair face, which even from a distance, Holly could see was cold and stern. The wolf had transformed into a woman. Holly had witnessed it with her own eyes, but she still couldn't believe it. What is happening? What is this place? The woman approached Max. He shrank away from her, trying helplessly to make himself small. She reached her an arm out, extending two thin fingers. Then she touched him on the head, gently, like she was annoy anointing him. The woman removed her hand, revealing a spot of gray on Max's head. The spot began to grow, spreading through his face and past his neck. Every part of him touched by, touched by gray became stolid and still. Solid and still. Like a statue. Soon Max's entire body was gray and motion, motionless. He sat frozen, an, an expression of terror etched on his face. The woman's touch had turned him to stone. Holly quickly ducked back behind the tree. What happened? She gasped, her voice trembling. What is that thing? The girl answered, her expression bleak. You're playing hide and seek, and that's it. Huh?